I have learned to be lonely because only solitude joins me in the immensity of the universe. Were it possible for me to achieve this solitude, I would start again where my early sketches guided me. I would consider everything that lies between, only as a preparation for that new and probably last creative phase. This is the building where Mendelssohn taught, and it's very typical of the kind of architecture he associated with the Bay Area. Informal wooden construction, shingled uh, or clabbered siding. There were very few senior Jewish faculty in the United States at that point, especially in the big private universities. The students had been campaigning for modern architecture for more than 15 years when he came. He was certainly the top international star they had ever had on the faculty. San Francisco, my beloved. Okay, so you want me to read all these words? Oh, December, just the date. December 24th, 1951. He arrives to San Francisco in 1945. He comes earlier to lecture at the university. The lectures go very well. He's very pleased with the people he meets here. He's pleased that it's published in a nice little book, Three Lectures on Architecture, uh, published by the University of California Press. And so he moves here in 1945. He sets up a partnership with two promising young architects, John Dinwiddie and Henry Hill. He's not easy to work with. Later he has more malleable assistants, I think. Uh, but certainly this helps him get a network of contractors. Dinwiddie and Hill are young, enthusiastic, but they know their way around town already. And there's the feeling in 1945 that the future of American architecture is here. Lewis Mumford will come out around 47 and announce as much. And then people on the East Coast, especially Gropius and Breuer, will fight back and say, no, we're the future of American architecture. Something more international, something more institutional, something on a larger scale. But when he comes out here, there's a sense that life here is informal, in a welcome way, but very sophisticated. San Francisco is a metropolis with deep European roots, but forward-facing, Pacific-facing, not trapped in its own past in a way I think he finds very exciting and far uh, more supportive of modernism in the 30s and through the 40s than any other place in the United States. It's, it's going to take till about 1950 for Chicago and New York to become as supportive as San Francisco as long did. So it, it seems an astute move at the time. In the long run, it doesn't do his career much good, but it's comfortable here, and I think he's always comfortable here. A Madeline Haas Russell is one of the young heiresses, one of the young Jewish heiresses in San Francisco. Her family's fortune goes back to Levi Strauss blue jeans. And the Haas family, she's born a Haas, is, is certainly the most important philanthropic family in 20th century Bay Area, until at least the very new money with Silicon Valley. And she replaces the old family house, a much more traditional house, with a large, imposing, uh, luxurious house with servants' rooms and stunning views out over the Golden Gate. Probably the best single building site in the city of San Francisco. And she does it, turning to an architect who can be depended upon to provide European sophistication and quotations of his most famous buildings, but also depended upon to appreciate a regional tradition that goes back to the arts and crafts movement, a woodsy tradition, to not be too ostentatious or too decorated, and to give her modern, understated sophistication. 